husband, Russell, is an artist. And I am May, and I have an interest in true crime. We decided to merge our two interests together. Enjoy this calming visual while listening to a tragic story. This is Stuart and Crime. E.E. E. Preacher Jackson was admitted to Nakona General Hospital for high fever and cellulitis, a bacteria infection of the skin. Yet he suddenly died from respiratory arrest. A nurse found him and slowly walked up to the nurse's station and quietly said she believed Preacher Jackson was dead. The man's grandson, Kirk Jackson, worked at the hospital, so that nurse went to him to tell him the news. He was, after all, her husband. But Preacher Jackson was more than just her grandfather-in-law. He was also one of the last victims to fall prey to the serial killer dubbed the Angel of Death, Vicki Don Jackson. Vicki grew up in Indiana, but at 15, she moved to Nakona, Texas with her family in the early 80s. She ended up getting a job at the same nursing home as her mom, working after school, starting in the laundry room, and moving up to nurse's aid her junior year of high school. Her dream was to grow up to be like Florence Nightingale. Florence Nightingale was an English social reformer and statistician and the founder of modern nursing. Nightingale came to prominence while serving as a manager and trainer of nurses during the Crimean War, in which she organized care for wounded soldiers. Vicki often felt people looked through her, the patients at the nursing home, their families, and often felt lonely. So she was very surprised when a construction worker walked up to her at a game room and told her she was cute. His name was Johnny McLaughlin, and although he was five years older than Vicky, just a few weeks later, she went to her parents and convinced them she was really in love. Still just a junior in high school, they got married, but unsurprisingly, they were divorced within a year. After this, she moved back home and graduated in May 1984. After graduation, she went to work full-time at the nursing home hoping to save up her money to attend college and become a licensed vocational nurse. But within six months, she would be pregnant by a man named Leroy Carson, who had paid her some attention. They were married in May 1985, and she gave birth to her son, Curtis, and quickly became pregnant again and had her daughter, Jennifer, in 1986. A year later, Vicki started going to nursing school part-time, while also raising two kids, cooking meals, cleaning the house, and working the night shift at the nursing home. This all seemed to be manageable until her parents, who were the kids' primary babysitters, decided to move back to Indiana. Although this was exhausting, she wouldn't listen to those telling her to slow down, and she became an LVN in 1989 and was promoted to a night shift nurse. According to an article in Texas Monthly, she was so devoted to her job that she sometimes took her children along to give the residents get well Crayola drawings that they had made. She liked to have copies of True Story on hand, a romance magazine she bought each month at the grocery store. And late at night, she'd read articles to some of her female patients about women meeting the men of their dreams and living in houses with white picket fences. Unfortunately, she couldn't make her own marriage like those she read about. Leroy moved out in 1994, and they divorced two years later. This, however, did not deter Vicki, who still dreamed of having the perfect marriage. She would frequent the town bar, Third Spur, to try and find a man, but had no luck. But in 1997, she decided, after spending an entire evening at the bar, to walk up to the next man who walked through the door and ask him to dance. That lucky man was Kirk Jackson, who worked as an aide at a nursing home in a nearby town. This news made Vicki believe it must be fate. And just like that, the two were married two months later, on July 4th, 1997. Then Kirk was hired at Nakona General Hospital to work the night shift as a nurse's aide. Vicki also got a job there as a night shift LVN, so the two of them could spend more time together. She also began taking courses at a community college to become a registered nurse. 
But this happy marriage soon turned sour. In that same interview with Texas Monthly, Vicky talked about how Kirk had never been married before, and on his nights off, he liked to have his friends come over to the house to drink and play cards. Vicky told him, Kirk, for the sake of the family, you've got to stop it. The kids can't sleep. She tried to talk to him about his alcohol use and his role as a husband, but he got mad and called her names. He told her, oh no, you're not going to control my life. In late 1999, tensions were so bad that Curtis, Vicky's son, went to live with his dad and her daughter Jennifer joined them a few months later. Because of this, her ex-husband went to court and Vicky was ordered to pay $300 a month in child support. After that, Vicky decided to go see a counselor where she admitted to being deeply depressed and felt rejected and unloved. Jennifer came to visit her mom one weekend. And Vicky told her she had been seeing a counselor and revealed that she might be bipolar. Jennifer asked her mom what that meant, and Vicky turned to her and said, It means I could kill you and get away with it. In a later interview, Jennifer said although she didn't believe her mom would hurt her, she stated, The next time I went over there for the weekend, I started sleeping with a baseball bat beside my bed. In the Texas Monthly interview, Vicki told a story of seeing two old classmates at the hospital visiting one of their mothers. Vicki said they never looked her way, like she wasn't even there. Losing her kids, struggling in her marriage, having to pay child support and feeling ignored by the very people she was caring for were all building her rage. And it was only a matter of time before that rage spilt over. I solemnly pledge myself before God and in the presence of this assembly to pass my life in purity and to practice my profession faithfully. I will abstain from whatever is deleterious and mischievous and will not take or knowingly administer any harmful drug. I will do all in my power to maintain and elevate the standard of my profession and will hold in confidence all personal matters committed to my keeping and all family affairs coming to my knowledge in the practice of my calling. With loyalty will I endeavor to aid the physician in his work, and as a missioner of health, I will dedicate myself to devoted service to human welfare. This is the Nightingale Pledge. Nurses take this pledge, or one similar to this, an oath Vicki lost sight of on December 11, 2000. Vicki walked into the room of a 100-year-old Donnie Jennings, a patient admitted for constipation and dehydration, put mevicarium chloride into her IV, and walked out. A nurse's aide found Jennings at 1.45 a.m., and although it was weird she had simply stopped breathing, her age made the hospital staff not look into the matter. Vicki volunteered to tell the family the grim news. Mivacarium chloride, or Mivacron, is used by doctors to momentarily paralyze a patient's respiratory system so that an oxygen tube can be inserted into the trachea. As soon as oxygen starts flowing, the effects of the drug quickly wear off. But if the dosage is high enough, and if no tube is pushing oxygen into the lungs, then the drug is deadly. December 20th, 2000. Vicki walked into the room of 87-year-old L.G. Hudson, admitted for a broken leg, and injected him with the drug. Then, 20 minutes later, she walked down the hall to 62-year-old Sanford Mitchell's room, admitted for chirosis, and injected him with the same drug. December 25, 2000. Vicki went into 50-year-old Barbara Atterbury admitted for back pain, and put the drug into her IV. Later, that same day, she went to 87-year-old Boyd Burnett's room, who was admitted for feeling disoriented, and gave the drug to him. December 29, 2000. She killed 80-year-old James Gore, admitted because he aspirated some food, and then she killed 79-year-old Gertie Matthews, admitted for dementia and a urinary tract infection. In the month of December alone, seven patients from Nakona General died after going into respiratory arrest. 
none of them had had any history of serious respiratory problems. Yet no questions were raised by this. Incredibly, the doctors and administrators didn't even get suspicious when five more patients died after going into respiratory arrest during the first eight days of January. The administration, in fact, was so happy with the way things were going that it approved an advertisement, nearly a full page in size, that began running in the Nakona News. It featured all the hospital's nurses and nurses' aides, Nurse Vicky being pictured at the top of the ad. Vicky seemed to be growing bolder because in mid-January, she decided to inject the drug into Jimmy Ray Holder while his wife sat beside him. Then she went after 95-year-old Oma Weiler. Twice. The first injection didn't work fast enough, and other nurses were able to resuscitate her. Four days later, however, Vicky decided to inject her again, succeeding in killing her. Though the hospital wasn't questioning so many deaths, in such a short time, the community of Nakona seemed to be alerted by the increase in deaths. Some of the small businesses, the funeral homes, and the flower shops were having record sales. Also, some of the other nurses at the hospital were confused by the deaths, sheepishly joking that the night shift was the killing crew. One nurse found it odd that Vicky was the last staffer whom several of the patients had seen before dying. Another nurse also found it odd that instead of calling from the room, Vicky had rather casually walked up to the nurse's station a couple of times to announce that she had noticed that a patient was having trouble breathing. But maybe all these deaths weren't random and would have been connected to Vicky sooner if they knew a little background on the patients that lost their lives. Barbara Atterbury and Boyd Burnett, for instance, had family members who used to make fun of Vicky during their days together at Nakona High School. Sanford Mitchell used to stare at her breast and call her Nurse Tits. L.G. Hudson's son, who was an EMT at Nakona General, worked part-time as a minister at a small evangelical church. Periodically, when he wasn't on call, he would hunt down Vicky and blithely tell her that all her personal problems would be resolved if only she would be born again. January 11, 2001, she killed 82-year-old pneumonia patient J.T. Nichols, and a few hours later killed 78-year-old John Williams, admitted for a sore on his foot. Vicki waited at the door of the hospital for Williams' son, Pat, to show up to tell him the grim news. Vicki had had a crush on Pat as a teenager, yet he had ignored her. But none of the nursing staff could bring themselves to believe that Vicky was somehow involved in killing patients. And according to Barbara Perry, the hospital's director of nursing, throughout all of 2000, the hospital had not received a single complaint from a patient about Vicky's personality or her nursing skills. Not one. Yet, this is not exactly true. According to the Texas Board of Nurses Committee, from May 8, 2000, through about February 6, 2001, she was counseled for numerous medication or treatment errors. January 30, 2001, Vicki injected 82-year-old Orville Moore, who had apparently called Vicki a mean name a day earlier. Minutes later, she entered the room of 14-year-old Lydia Weatherhard, admitted with appendicitis. Lydia knew Vicky's children, and Vicky heard recently that Lydia turned her son Curtis down for a date. Thankfully, Lydia's mom was in the room and called for the doctor right away when she seemed to be struggling and was quickly revived. January 31, 2001. Vicky went after 46 year old Donna Kernett, who was actually able to reach the nurse's button, and as they rushed to help her, Another staffer shouted that another patient had gone into respiratory arrest. 35 year old Lisa Pelkey, who was able to be intubated before any brain damage could happen. Donna, however, never regained consciousness and died a few weeks later. 
Finally, the hospital was in an uproar. Then, a technician from the hospital's pharmacy walked up to Chief of Staff Lynn Dingler and asked him if it was important that the vials of Mibrocone were missing from one of the crash carts. After reviewing their records, the hospital's administrators learned that Vicky was not only working at the time of every respiratory arrest, but that she was often the last staffer who had been seen checking on the patients who had died. While they were deciding what to do with her, at that point, they had no legal cause for firing her. They made a huge mistake. Inexplicably, they didn't order anyone to keep an eye on her, and Vicky was given the chance to take out her revenge on her husband. Which brings us back to Preacher Jackson, her grandfather-in-law. Charles Norris, the hospital CEO, met with the town's young police chief, Kent Holcomb, to talk about the deaths. Holcomb called the Texas Rangers and the FBI. When the law enforcement agencies realized that they didn't have a shred of physical evidence that proved Vicki was murdering patients, they set up a hidden camera aimed at a supply of mivacorium chloride, hoping they could catch Vicki stealing some vials. To keep Vicki from learning about their investigation, they had also asked the hospital's administrators and doctors not to reveal anything about what they were doing. They even threw Vicki and her mother-in-law a birthday party. February 17, 2001. 61-year-old Donnelly Reed was admitted to the hospital for post-polio syndrome. Vicki showed up at the nurse's station and said, You better go check on Mr. Reed. He's making a snorting, horse-like sound. A doctor and other nurses were able to resuscitate Reed. And when they asked him what had happened, he said, a blonde-haired nurse had come in, put something into his IV. She then smiled and said, can I do anything else for you? Before she was out the door, Reed said, I felt like a spring was uncoiling in my head. I couldn't breathe. Two days after the attack on Reed, law enforcement officers discovered a syringe in the garbage can at Vicki and Kirk's house. Tests later proved that it contained traces of Mivecron. Both Kirk and Vicky stated they had no clue how the syringe got there. After this, both were fired from the hospital, although no one believed Kirk was involved, since nurses' aides are not allowed to handle medication. Vicky went on with life as usual, but after a while, Kirk left town telling Vicky he was having trouble sleeping. Apparently, he had been having nightmares about her stabbing him with a needle. Before they could arrest Vicki for murder, police investigators had to be able to prove that patients had been killed. That meant that they had to get a court order to exhume the bodies of those patients who had suffered respiratory arrest and then perform autopsies to determine if those bodies contained mavicarium chloride. The exhumation order was signed May 2, 2001, by Montague County Justice of the Peace, and 10 bodies were exhumed starting in June. Of 2001. According to an article in the Houston Chronicle, the drug leaves few traces and the testing itself is said to be a very lengthy process, conducted at only a handful of laboratories in the country and requiring weeks to complete. All 10 bodies were found to have traces of the drug in their system. As the months passed, Vicki decided to get a job as an LVN at a nursing home in Gainesville, just east of Nakona telling the administrators that she loved working with older patients. And conveniently, she left out Nakona General Hospital off the application of previous employers. But within just a few weeks, she was fired after the administrators suspected her of attempting to steal medication. Finally, in July 2002, Vicki was arrested at a grocery store in Bowie, where she then worked. She was taken to Montague County Jail, where she was to be held while her lawyers prepared her for trial. In 2003, two civil suits were filed against Vicki and the hospital. Unfortunately, I could not find out what happened in these cases. March 14, 2005, a judge declared a mistrial in Vicki's case, saying a prosecutor's comment during opening statements prejudiced jurors. 
This is what went down. Vicki Don Jackson's attorney asked for the mistrial after prosecutor, Ralph Guerrero, said no one may ever be able to provide a motive, not even Jackson herself, for the crimes at Nakona General Hospital four years ago. Defense attorney Bruce Martin said that that indicated Jackson would testify even though she is not required to do so. State District Judge Roger Towery initially overruled the objection, but then took a two-hour break. He declared a mistrial after Martin repeated his objection before beginning his opening statements. While waiting for the second trial to begin, questions arose if Vicki was competent to stand trial. When she had reported hearing voices, she went and saw Dr. Lisa Clayton. Lisa Clayton wrote in a report that said Jackson was competent to stand trial. Vicki Don Jackson has a mixed personality disorder with antisocial, narcissistic, and histrionic personality traits. Dr. Lisa went on to state, It is my medical opinion that Miss Jackson does have the personality traits of someone who could have committed the offenses of which she is accused. And then she added that Jackson sees people as objects. She does not have the ability to form deep personal attachments or empathize with others. The trial was planned to be a month long in San Angelo, where the case had been moved because of intense publicity around Nakona, which is near Wichita Falls. But a week before the trial started, Vicki decided to plead no contest. According to her attorney, Bruce Martin, he said that Vicki had told him it was important to her that a jury never find her guilty of murder. She has never admitted guilt, and she was never convicted by a jury, Martin said. Those things meant something to her. Surprisingly, the state still had to prove its case and would present an abbreviated version to the judge because in a no-contest plea, the defendant does not admit guilt. Both sides say they expect state district judge Roger Towery to find Jackson guilty. The prosecutor said only one agent, instead of many witnesses, would testify about the evidence because he had thoroughly investigated the case but it was originally planned to call 58 witnesses if the case had gone to trial that next week. She is suspected to have between 10 to 20 victims. Vicki Don Jackson was sentenced to life in prison. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like and subscribe button below. If you want to inquire about a commission, you can email Russell at russellstewart.art at gmail.com. You can watch Russell live stream his art on Twitch. And if you want to hear more true crime stories, you can subscribe to my podcast, Crimes of a Decade, a Texas true crime podcast. Now that we are done, make sure to wash the brush. Just beat the devil out of it. <laughs>